אז אני רוצה לדבר על מערכות לא מאוישות, ובפרט על ה... תמריצים שנוצרים על ידי המערכות לא מאוישות, שזה בכל זאת משהו אחר, כן? תכף נראה איך, איך, למה זה משהו אחר. אז קודם, יש להבהיר שאמצעי לחימה קיימים כדי לא להשתמש בהם. בשביל זה הם קיימים, כן? בשביל לא להשתמש בהם. נתתי הרצאה... בחיל רפואה לפני כמה שבועות ו... ו... והדוברים דיברו על, על מערכות מסוימות ש... שלא משתמשים בהן וחבל לפתח ל... ל... מערכות שלא משתמשים בהן, זה עולה הרבה כסף. אז תדעו לכם, כל המערכות הן נועדים כדי... לא להשתמש בהם, כן? בשביל זה יוצרים אמצעי אה, לחימה. הם נועדים, הם קיימים כדי ליצור תמריצים מסוימים אצל האויב, כן? ואם התמריצים האלה פועלים כדבר, אז לא ישתמשו בהם, ואז הם מוצלחים, כן? אז הדוגמה הכי בולטת של הדבר הזה, זה המלחמה הקרה, ואלוף משנה זקס הזכיר שקיבלתי פרס נובל בהזדמנות מסוימת, ואיתי, כן, אני לא קיבלתי את כל הפרס, קיבלתי רק חצי הפרס, והחצי השני קיבל פרופסור תומאס שלינג. שהוא היה מהארכיטקטים של המלחמה הקרה מצד האמריקאים. והוא דיבר, אני דיברתי בשטוקהולם על, על מלחמה ושלום, זה היה הנושא של הרצאת הנובל שלי, והוא דיבר על שישים השנים המופלאות. איזה שישים שנים מופלאות, זה היה ב-2005 בדיוק, אז זה היה שישים שנה בדיוק אחרי אה, הירושימה ונגסקי. ובשישים השנים האלה לא השתמשו אף פעם בנשק גרעיני בכעס. כן, זאת אומרת, עשו ניסויים, אבל בכעס לא השתמשו בנשק גרעיני בכל השנים האלה. ו... הסיבה שלא השתמשו בנשק הגרעיני הזה בכעס הוא שזה היה שם, זה היה קיים אצל שני הצדדים וזה יצר את התמריצים לא להשתמש בהם ואוי ואבוי אם לא היה הנשק הגרעיני הזה אז היו משתמשים בנשק איום ונורא שלא גר, גרעיני אבל זה מנע את ה... מה שמנע את מלחמת העולם השלישית היה... A third world war. And that for the fact that between... For about 40 or 50 years, there were planes in the air. Both sides had them with nuclear bombs in the air 24-7. 365 and a quarter days per annum for 40 years they were up there and that is what prevented the third world war in other words this whole issue of weaponry and warfare is that it should exist not to be used another example is the Gulf War the Gulf War, we, the first one here, at the beginning of the 90s, they, of course, had to give out um, gas masks to the population, and after the war ended, all those clever guys said, what a waste of money they were giving out the gas masks, and they weren't used. Well... It wasn't only 
the fact that one can thank God that they weren't used. But the reason that they were not used was that because was because you had them. They had them. At least part of the reason was because the enemy knew, or at least thought they knew, that that the use of gas would be less efficient since people actually had that to defend themselves. Recently, I heard that they're going to stop giving out gas masks, maybe because they're not being used. Well, I think, I think that that would be erroneous to do something like that, because the fact that they have the gas masks creates incentives in the eyes and the hands of the enemies not to use their gas weaponry. And the last example is, the, is Ronald Reagan's Star Wars in the 80s of, an, of the 20th century. Yes, there is an assumption that the collapse the, of the of USSR in 1989-1990 was to a great degree due to Reagan Star Wars. What did it actually cause? What did it do? It was supposed to neutralize an assault of missiles directed from USSR against the United States. And it was said that such an attack, basically, he was actually, he was actually mocked Reagan. I'm not quite sure whether it did work or not and whether it was justifiably mocked or not, but the fact is that, they, that there was a chance that it might work. And that strength, that actually ability to, to deter was lesser. And therefore, they were in the hands of the United States during the Cold War. So if we're talking about weaponry being existent, actually being there in order not to be used, and then let's look at the incentives that have been created. Let us have a look at this game for a moment. If, if Reuven walks to the right-hand side, then Shimon will have to choose between one or zero. Should he receive one or should he receive naught? So if Shimon goes to the right-hand side, he will receive one. If Shimon goes to the left-hand side, he will receive naught. And therefore, Shimon chooses, if he's rational, and that's what we're investigating and researching, in the Feldman um, building at the Hebrew University. That's what we are researching on the second floor. I'm not quite sure whether these unmanned systems here, Colonel Zach's unmanned systems usually work, but at the moment they're not working very well. In other words, he's saying that his computer isn't working very well. In other words, if Reuven goes to the right-hand side, then Shimon has to choose between one or naught. Well, he'll choose one. He'll prefer that. And therefore, Reuven will receive three. If Reuven walks to the left-hand side, then he, Shimon will only receive two. Okay, I know. All right. I'm trying to work this one out. If you can't use it with force, then just use a little bit more force, a little excessive force, and it'll work. That's, he's laughing with about the computer. He's just using a bit more if force. Okay, if Reuven goes left, he'll only get two. 
after all, he would prefer three to two. So therefore, he'll go to the right, won't he? And then... And then Shimon will only get one. So instead of the two that, that Shimon could have got had Reuven gone to the left-hand side. So therefore, what is happening here? Shimon... If Shimon could only been able to persuade Reuven that whatever happens, if Shimon needs to choose, he will choose left. Had he been able to, to persuade Reuven that, then Reuven would have gone to the left-hand side as well. And then he would have received two and not one. But I'm not quite sure whether he'll be able to convince him or not. So let's have a look at a really important historical application of this kind of idea. Here is the Cold War. Here you can see a picture of the Cold War as it was as it was envisioned in the United States. The USSR is the top of that curve. It can either attack or not attack with nuclear weaponry. What happens if the USSR does attack? If the USSR does attack, then the United States can either react or not react. Now, if a couple of nuclear bombs have already landed on some of the central towns in the United States, let's say Washington, D.C. And, and New York, then there's no point um, for the United States to react. Not only is there no point, it would only bring about a negative situation. It would only expand it. It would only create more of the pandemonium and chaos. No one will come up with a winning hand here if they react. So therefore, the result is that the United States feels that it's not worthwhile reacting. And therefore, there is an incentive to the USSR to, yes, attack. Yes, the USR is in, has that incentive to attack, and that was a central problem in the strategic thinking in the States in the 50s and the 60s. Perhaps even that went on into the 70s of the 20th century. How can the USA persuade USSR that it will react despite everything, even if it isn't worthwhile for it reacting? How can they persuade the USSR? How can the USSR that they will react despite what they think? What is the crux of this whole matter? That is the, the issue of commitment, what Thomas, Professor Thomas Schelling calls a commitment. How can you... Or what is the importance of this commitment or self-commitment, basically. I think that one of his in central insights is the importance of that self-commitment. So in other words, in the first game, it says that if Shimon commits to go left, then we can already see what will happen. So if, if Shimon commits to go to the left, then Ruven will understand that he must also go left. And then both of them will receive two. And in other words, both sides will benefit. Both parties will benefit. So ostensibly, it looks as if that you are decreasing that whole space of maneuver of a player 
um, is not always, I mean, does not always benefit him. In other words, if you cannot do something, then ostensibly it appears, then it will be detrimental to you. But that is actually incorrect. Schelling understood that it is incorrect, that it is inaccurate. These are very basic, elementary issues embedded in national security issues. Very important. And unfortunately, time is of the essence, and I haven't actually got a lot of it now on the stage. In other words, Odysseus' sirens, for example, when he got close to the sirens there in Sicily, he asked the Odyssey, he asked to be tied up because he wanted to get, sorry, he asked to be tied up and get as close as possible to them. In other words, you are limiting that whole space of maneuver. In other words, why did the bus drivers in New York have no change? In other words, it decreased their possibilities because had they had change to be able to give to people who were paying for their ticket, it would have created an incentive for certain people to try and and get small change out of a bigger bill. So they, they limited that possibility. So the decisive issue is, the question is, can a person He's despondent about because of the computer. How can Ruven practically commit? Sorry, I stand corrected. How can Shimon correct, actually practically commit to react even if it isn't really in their favor? So that question has become central in the Cold War. It was truly a central issue. How can one commit to reacting? And in the Cold War, the question was, how can the United States practically commit? commit? And there was a full feature film called Fail Safe at the time. And the pilot of that, that was actually had the, the nuclear bomb on board, received a command erroneously to go and bomb Moscow. And there was no way of actually, uh, actually stopping or curbing it and um, cancelling the actual order. And another example of how does one prevent the hijacking of planes, you can actually isolate the actual cockpit totally in such a way so that there'll be absolutely no connection between, no communication between the actual cockpit and the rest of the plane, the cabin. So in other words, it's a kind of self-commitment to continue with the flight, whatever, against all odds. And so therefore the hijacker will not be able to give commands to the pilot because had he been able to give those commands to the pilot, then he would have had to listen to it. And, but he has that kind of self-commitment, that kind of commitment. So the question is, how does one create this kind of possibility. Basically, what it says is that unmanned systems expand one's physical capability to commit to something in certain given conditions. For example, a system that reacts automatically to any kind of launching of rocket by a one-off bombing 
of that source of launch, in other words, on the launch pad immediately. In other words, that there should be no possibility to actually curb the activity of that system. After the launch, there is no way one can stop. It would be very desirable to notify in advance about the action that the system is going to take, because we are, we are interested that they should not be launched, and we will not react, and they have to know, because if they do not know that, they may still launch the rockets. That is just one example of a strategic use which is in contrast to the tactical use of unmanned systems. In other words, those unmanned systems create the possibility of creating incentives on the other side or the other party. No, 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 I'm really cross with what's happening here with the computer, says the speaker. Oh, this unmanned system is really not working properly. I'm going to be the one moving it. No, but I want to be independent. Okay. So that is just one example of the strategic use, which is in contrast to the tactical use. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ladies and gentlemen, no, but it's okay, it's okay. In unmanned systems. It keeps happening. In other words, the intention of a tactical use is that an unmanned system can do things better than than a man system can do. In other words, but here what we're saying is that an unmanned system cannot commit while a man system can commit. So it's not better or worse. All I'm saying is that it is not capable of doing it. A man system is capable of doing that. That's what I'm trying to sell you all here. Okay. So, Colonel Yoav Zaks asked me to relate to the moral side, the ethical side, and he asked if there's no ethical problem in the use of an unmanned system that kills in an unknowing fashion. First of all, I have to say that I am an expert in game theory, but not in morality. And uh, morality is not an academic subject. You have to be able to answer that question without being an expert. The various experts do not go out into the battlefield. And therefore, in my humble opinion, if a certain action, X, is moral when it is carried out by a man system, there isn't even a shadow of an ethical problem when the same action is carried out by an unmanned system. On the contrary, if a Star Wars is involved, an unmanned system against and working against another unmanned system, all the better. Few, fewer people are killed. On the contrary, let them uh, have it out. If, as it says, uh, uh, in uh, Samuel, when it says, let the young man play before us, when the generals said that to one another, they were all, all those young men were killed. But here, if, uh, if we're indeed talking about an unmanned system fighting against another unmanned system, 
All the better. But even if we are talking about an unmanned system fighting against humans, for example, in the case of rockets and the example I gave, then in my humble opinion, the unmanned system has an ethical precedence. Because the unmanned system is supposed to incentivize the enemy not to shoot the rocket from the outset. If it's a man system, if there's a commander, he has to say, respond, and perhaps he will do it and perhaps he won't do it. <coughs> if he's afraid of harming civilians or something like that, he won't do it. And even if it, <coughs> it does not succeed in incentivizing the enemy not to fire the rockets, then it, it will be the responsibility of the enemy because it caused the catastrophe to itself. And I would just like to say one thing by way of conclusion. When we ask questions of morals and ethics, we need to ask ourselves, is this this action ethical? Do we consider it as ethical or not? What others say, it may be interesting, but much less so. We need, first of all, to ask ourselves how others, how what we believe, and clearly, if the system is completely automatic, somebody fires a rocket and it automatically responds, then it is the one who fired the rocket who caused the response, and I have no ethical problem with that. And to, in conclusion, in addition to the tactical advantage,